Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the service today. We're glad you're all here. Uh, thankful for those who are watching online. Had a rough few days around here, haven't we? It's been kind of interesting. I uh, couldn't believe we got the second tornado warning. Uh, it was uh, yesterday, right? Uh, days of kind of you know lost sleep there that night, and then kind of haven't been trying to make it up all week, but haven't been able to ever since Thursday night. But uh, anyway, a few announcements to share with you. Uh, to, uh, well, first of all, don't forget our baby bottles. There's still a few more back there if you want to pick one up uh, for Hope Pregnancy Center. Uh, I'll be turning those back in on uh, Father's Day, so be aware of that. Tonight at 4 o'clock, we're going to have a, uh, a, a Colgan celebration of all of you. Uh, just a time to celebrate you and all you meant to us. Uh, the following week, I think there's information in your bulletin there. They're going to have your celebration of us. So we decided we'd have one for all of you. So, so anyway, that's our plan. Uh, come and join us 4 o'clock uh, this afternoon. And we're going to have uh, Molly and I made all kinds of uh, homemade noodles. We're going to have chicken and noodles and green beans and corn and mashed potatoes. And I, I don't know what else. Uh, oh, and dessert. We're going to have some cake and... Uh, uh, the cobbler and that kind of thing. Lots of food, so be sure and come back. It will be a little bit of celebration for, for Mary. She doesn't want to be the center of attention, but we decide we need to at least do something for her graduating uh, high school, so we'll have a little, little part of that. Uh, we're going to play three games. Uh, one of them is going to be, how well do you know Mary? So anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> today as we continue in this series on God's faithfulness, we, we are uh, going to go, we're going to start in Hebrews uh, 13 verse 5 uh, where we find God's promise I'll never leave you or forsake you and uh, then we're going to look at a few stories from scripture that uh, are examples of God never leaving or forsaking someone uh, I think I think it'll it'll work but let's uh, let's pray together now as we enter into worship Heavenly Father we thank you for this day we thank you for your many many blessings and we just uh, pray that you would be very present with us in the service today Lord, speak to our hearts. Help us to, to just understand your faithfulness in a better way. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's sing together. Amen. Let's stand as we worship this morning. We're going to invite his presence.
Lord, we thank you. We praise you for your faithfulness, for your goodness. In these difficult days, we thank you for this promise that you will hold us fast. You will hold us with your righteous right hand, Lord. It, it's an incredible promise of your presence and of your love, of your faithfulness. And Lord, we just thank you today for who you are and all that you mean to us, Lord. It's in your presence that we find joy and love and grace and everything we need, Lord. We just, we praise you today. We thank you. We, we thank you that uh, these, these, while these storms did, did some pretty good damage, there, there's not, no one passed away and, and, and very few injuries, Lord. It's really remarkable. And we just praise you for that and, and thank you for, for that, Lord. Lord, we also, we lift up our, our church in this time of transition, Lord. We pray for uh, our superintendent and the appointments committee and uh, our board and, and just everyone involved with bringing the next pastor here, Lord. We just ask that uh, you would provide the right person, that you would bless them even right now. Prepare their hearts for coming. And Lord, we just put them into your hands, whoever they are. We, we don't know yet, but, but Lord, we are trusting you and we are looking to you and, and know that you hold us all fast. We are all in your hands. And so, Lord, we just pray that uh, you would, would work all this out. We just put that, we just trust you with this, Lord. Lord, we ask for, we, we lift up those that need a touch from you today. Lord, we, we lift up Cecil Willingham. He's back in the hospital, not, not doing very well at all. And, and Lord, we just, just ask for healing. And we ask that you would be very near to him, speak to him, Lord. Uh, help the doctors as they try to help him, Lord. We put him in your hands. Lord, we continue to pray for Kim Little today. Lord, we thank you that uh, uh, for the progress that he has made, really incredible progress. And, and Lord, we just pray, we thank you, he's back home. But Lord, continue to touch him and bring healing to his body, Lord. We lift up Margie Sherman to you. Again, Lord, we thank you that she's able to come home yesterday and, and is doing so well. Lord, we just ask, again, help her as she gets sort of readjusted to being at home and, and just bless her and, and Tim as well, Lord. Lord, we lift up our friend John Lancaster, a Wabash Park Camp Director. Lord, we just pray that you would be near him. Uh, he has bone cancer and his wife has cancer. Lord, just surround this beautiful couple with, with your love, with your presence, with your healing. Lord, we lift up others who are dealing with cancer as well. We lift up Etta to you. Continue to be with her each and every day. We lift up Mary Davis and Mary Kite and Barbara. And Lord, just be with all those that are, are struggling with this. Uh, cancer is an awful thing, but we lift them to you. And just ask for your, your healing. Lord, we continue to, to lift uh, Rita to you today. Uh, thank you for the fact that she's healing well. But continue to help her, Lord, as she's uh, on this path. And we just pray very quickly she would uh, uh, you know, have complete healing in that knee, Lord. We just lift her to you. Lord, we continue to pray for Donnie. Be with him as he goes to the doctor this week. And we pray that they'd be able to, to set up a time for his back surgery. And, and Lord, we just, just pray that that would be able to happen. Thank you. Lord, for the progress he's made in, in being ready for that surgery, Lord. Continue to be with him. Lord, I pray, I lift up my sister to you and others that are, are that have COVID right now. Uh, Lord, it seems like the numbers are going back up, and we just pray, Lord, you would be with us all as we uh, continue to deal with this, Lord. Uh, but but uh, uh, we, we thank you for the progress that's been made there as well. Uh, Lord, we lift up Ukraine to you. We pray that you would be in that situation. We just want peace. We want peace in, in our world. We know you are the answer for peace. And Lord, I, I think of those that don't know you, and we pray that they would find you. They would find your peace. They'd find your love, uh, your salvation. Lord, you are so good and so faithful. Uh, Lord, we uh, lift up those that are shut in, those in the nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Lord, just continue to... Uh, uh, be with them and, and be near them. Lord, I thank you that Louise is able to be here today. And, and Lord, it's been a long, hard road for her, uh, really over these last couple, three years. And, and I, I just thank you, Lord, for, for her to be able to, to come today and continue to bless her and, and be with her and Charlie, Lord. Uh, just thank you for them. Lord, uh, we, we uh, thank you for this opportunity to worship you. We just ask that you would be very real in our midst, that you would continue to speak to us. May we leave here different than what we came in. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Pastor, can we uh, have prayer for Bud and Sandra? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's pray for them. Lord, we, uh, 
lift up Norm's brother to you and his sister-in-law. Lord, they are in a very difficult situation and uh, moving to assisted living, all that goes into to a lot of that. We just lift them to you. Uh, be faithful or speak to them and be near them. Help them to sense your, your presence with them, Lord. We just lift them before you. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is our uh, Missions Sunday, and it's been a while since we've mentioned our, our missionaries. Uh, the the Rhinans, the, that uh, part of it, we, we talked a lot about the Cahills, but I thought I would share with you the latest on the Rhinans. Got an email from them this week, and uh, it, it began this way, to, to Togo we go. Uh, we're off today. It's May 18th. Uh, Alicia Takpali, daughter of Superintendent Dose uh, Takpali of, of the Free Methodist Church of Togo. Uh, Kate Junitinen, Junitinen, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mike's uh, administrative assistant and myself, Vicki, are leaving from Indianapolis to go to Togo via Brussels. Uh, we have a picture of them, I think, up here. They were getting ready. To, there you go. There's three of them without Mike there. But... Uh, uh, it says on, on the 19th, two leaders from Thrive Ministries in Kenya, Yvonne Mutafuta and Lillian Kanji, will begin their travels from Nairobi to Lome, Togo, via Ivory Coast. We have a picture of them as well, Molly. There we go. Uh, for the following uh, eight days, Yvonne and Lillian will be leading several training sessions with three young women from the Free Methodist Church in Togo, introducing Thrive Ministries with the hope that a similar program can be started in Togo. In addition to raising awareness about human traffic and gender-based violence, the Thrive Leaders will focus on the importance of discipleship and community building. Uh, this will be Yvonne and Lillian's first time traveling internationally, so do pray for them as they navigate two airports and different flight connections. We're excited about this opportunity for them to invest in others in a different way than they have in Kenya. And we're looking forward to seeing how God will work. Uh, Kate and I are, are ready to serve alongside them as they lead the way. Pray for them and for us and for the young women in Togo who are ready to receive this training. And there's this quick institute update. So glad for contributors be, uh, helping with progress on the teacher's residence of Wesley Missionary Institute. Slab has been poured. Ceiling and ground floor parts. I think we got a picture of that as well. There you go. Actually, I think there's another one there, Molly. Go to the next one if you would. Uh, they're building this building. And we've, we've prayed for uh, Wesley Missionary Institute. Uh, several months ago, you may remember when they... Uh, you know, they're talking about getting it going and they were excited. They, were, they kind of put it off for a little while because of COVID and then they just decided, hey, we got to go for it. So that's what they did. This is uh, also the first class of students arrived back on campus after the two month internship. Again, another photo. There you go. Uh, one more course for them together with the incoming class of students. The teacher is Logan Butson, uh, presenting how a, a small business can help them as partially self-supporting missionaries like Paul the tent maker. Pray for the outgoing class, soon headed for their home countries and arranging for their place of service. You say one more prayer request. Pray for Mike traveling to Cameroon next Wednesday, May 25th. Uh, Mike and Reverend Wilson Asambi will be hold the annual mission district meeting, uh, visit some new church plants and provide some instruction for the Free Methodist Church Cameroon uh, as further development. Uh, and they say, God bless you, Mike and Vicki. Well, let's, uh, let's pray for them now. Lord, we thank you for the Rhinans. We thank you for the Cahills. We thank you for uh, their service to you as they've gone, uh, the Cahills to Asia and, and Rhinans to Africa. Lord, we just ask your blessings on them and their ministry. May they be so fruitful. And we thank you for the role we get to play. Uh, and we just ask your blessings on them. Thank you for each one that's, that gives and supports them, Lord. Uh, bless them. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I want to make a, a bold statement today as we begin the, the sermon. Sometimes I like to do that just to let you know just what this is all about. And, and this am, amazing statement really is, is woven throughout Scripture. And it's, it really needs to be woven into our hearts, uh, into the very fabric of our, of our lives. It's this sim simple statement. God is with us. God is with us. It's so simple. Uh, we are never alone. The God of the universe knows us. He loves us and is constantly faithful to be with us. Outwardly, we may be alone. Outwardly, everyone around us may desert us. But the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us. 
His presence is the answer to every fear, to every anxiety, to the burdens and concerns that keep us awake at night. Those times when we wonder what tomorrow will bring. Maybe when our phones start buzzing and the siren starts wailing uh, Thursday night telling us there's a, a tornado warning and, and there's a tornado headed right for us. We had no idea when that first went off. I mean, it seems like always around here, they go a little north or a little south, but never do they hit us right on. So what do you do? Well, it's so wonderful to know that God is with us, that he is there to hold us fast. He is faithful. Now, later when we came to realize that our house was directly in line with where the tornado went. I don't know if you saw that on the map, but it went right over our house. Now, Thankfully, we had very little damage, and we were we had really no damage, a few limbs down, but that's about it, and, and we were all safe. I'm thankful for that. God is, is so good, and, and I know, here's the thing, I know there were those that were less fortunate than, than we were, but either way, God is still faithful. He is still present with us. Besides the recent weather, we, we live in, in such incredibly uncertain times. COVID going back up again. My sister has it. Uh, the night she came down with it, a little earlier in the evening, she had hugged my mom. We're, we're still waiting. Uh, you know, hopefully she won't get it, but, but I don't know. And, and the, the, the economy continues to go down. There's a shortage of, of formula, baby formula. I've heard stories that a baby's going into the hospital because there's no formula for them. There's a war going on in Ukraine. Oh, no, we could go. In times like this, we all have questions that we can't answer. We worry and fret, and, and in some ways, it's, it's with good reason that we worry, right? To, that we're a little bit fearful, with that fear builds in our hearts. That's why it's so important that we know this truth. We have this truth as a foundation to our hearts and lives. God is with us. No matter what, he loves us and is present today, just as he was yesterday, just as he was Thursday night and, and last week and last month and the last two and a half years of, of COVID and, and, and on and on we could go. Really, he's been there throughout each of our lives. He's been present with us. He is faithful. We don't have to worry about tomorrow because God is already there. God says to each of us, don't worry, I've got this. These are the words I, I want to leave you with. I'm, I'm signing the letter of my ministry with you in him who is always faithful. I believe that from the bottom of my heart. God is faithful. God showed me a sign, uh, showed me this a, a week ago, and it gave me a real sense of peace. We had a great time in Bloomington last Sunday. Even my girls noticed. They said it first before we did. We were very nervous as we, you know, we drove up there from mom. We stayed at mom and dad's house Saturday night. We drove up to Bloomington. We're all kind of on edge. And, and we get to the parking lot. We're like, oh, you know, what, where are we, you know, this, <laughs> it's a big deal. And, and we're going to be meeting lots of new people and all this stuff. We're really, you know, it's like we walked through the door and this great sense of peace came on us. And, and like I said, my girls were the ones to first notice it. It just seemed like, uh, in a weird way, it, it seemed like this is right. This is where we're, we're supposed to, to be. And, and our hearts still break. Understand, our hearts still break over leaving here. Of, all, of leaving all of you in, in a few weeks. But it seemed clear to us the Lord wanted us there. And I don't know, as, I'm, as we're going through this, as I'm, literally as I'm greeting people, people are coming in and, and, you know, we're meeting these people for the first time. This thought came to my head, in my brain. You never know how my brain's going to work, but this thought came into my brain that, that while there is still uncertainty about who the pastor is going to be here, and I know John shared about that last week, but there's still uncertainty about who's going to be here, but... But there was this sense of, of, okay, the Lord wants us there. And if the Lord wants us there, he's going to take care of here. And I believe that with all my heart. And like I said, that's the peace. I, I got that peace while I'm greeting these new people. A kind of interesting thing. If he wants us there, he has someone great to come in here. Someone that will be just who this church needs to lead them into the future that God has for you. Why? Because God is faithful. 
He is always faithful and he promises to be with us no matter what happens to us. It's true today and it'll be true tomorrow. and It'll be the true the day after tomorrow and all the days after that. We cannot outlive God's grace and mercy and love and goodness. He is faithful. It's who he is. He will not forget you because he cannot forget you. To all our fears, all our struggles, all our uncertainties, the Lord simply says, I am with you always. Like I said earlier, we're, we're going to start today in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And this is where the writer of Hebrews, he's wrapping up his letter to, to the Hebrew people. And, and uh, he, he's, he's sort of giving them these final, final words. And, and these are some of, like I said, these are his last words. And he's giving them a long list of sort of do's and don'ts. He's just wrapping up all that he's saying to them. And, and these are, are some, uh, he, he's giving this, uh, he ends this by saying this. <laughs> Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Again, this is just a list of do's and don'ts. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And it's just part of that list. Why? Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. God knew. We, we, we doubt this promise. So he wrapped it in, in these five negative uh Thanks. He, in the Greek, there's five different negatives here. Twice he repeats two Greek words that mean no. And, and then he adds another word that also means no. And it's hard to bring out the, the proper emphasis in English. And, and it's, as if, it's as if God is saying, I will never, 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 never leave you, nor never. <laughs> never forsake you. Absolutely not. I will not forsake you. That's what, what's going on here. It's much deeper than what we have here in the English. And even though the English is it's good, it says it well, but, but it doesn't really get at what the writer was going for. I will never, 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 never leave you. Absolutely not. It's really an incredible promise of God. It shows his amazing faithfulness. Years ago, when uh, Charles Spurgeon, who's known as the Prince of Preachers, preached on this passage, he, he touched on four examples, and I want to kind of follow that today. Uh, these, uh, there's countless numbers of times God says, I'll be with you in the Bible. But here are four of them, and, and I want to share them with you today. And like I said, we're going to kind of follow Spurgeon's outline on this and look at some of these stories. The first story was Jacob the Cheater. Jacob, you, you probably know, he's always been one of the more interesting uh, people in, in Scripture to me. He, he's a cheater, he, he's a manipulator, and yet he was blessed by God. And if you remember his story, he, he goes on the run uh, because he stole the inheritance from his brother Esau. He deceives his father into giving him a blessing that was meant for his brother. Uh, that double deceit sort of destroys the, the family. And... and, and, and uh, it enraged his brother, and he wanted to kill him. His family's threatened. He runs for his life. Then one night, he, he lays down, and he's using a stone as his pillow. Sleeping in the wilderness under this bright, starry sky, he dreams of angels coming and going on a ladder that, that stretched from earth to, to heaven. And until that moment, God had never spoken to Jacob. To his grandfather Abraham, yeah, God had spoken directly to him. To, to his father Isaac, yeah, God had spoken directly to him. But God had never spoken directly to Jacob. I'm sure the last thing Jacob expected to hear that night was the voice of the Lord, right? He's on the run. You know, he, he uh, why, why would God want to speak to him, right? He did all this stuff to his father and to his brother, messed up his whole family. But, but God meets him at his point of desperation as he's headed away from the promised land, running from his brother, running for his life. He's disgraced and guilty, and that's when God speaks to him. These are the words the Lord spoke to Jacob when he's running away from his problems. Genesis 28, 15, it says this. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. In the midst of his pain, in the midst of his regret and failure, God speaks to Jacob, promising Jacob his presence. C.S. Lewis, Lewis called pain this. He said, God's, it's God's megaphone to rouse a sleepy world. And the point being, the Lord whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts in our pain. He gets our attention when things are not going well, when there's struggle, when, when it's, it's hard, when life is hard. That's when he gets our attention. 
So in Jacob's life, now at last, he's ready to hear, ready to listen to the Lord. When the painful truth finally catches up with Jacob, he has nowhere to go. I'm sure the question is hard. said, you know, what, what, what started at this point? I mean, what, what have I done? What have I done to my family? Why did I, why did I cheat? Why do I, you know, why did I do this now? What do I do now? What, what hope is there for me in the future? Why would God have anything to do with me? But here's God's message. Jacob, I'm never going to leave you. I will always be with you. I am nearer to you than you think I am. I was there when you tricked Esau. I was there when you, when you tricked your father, deceived him. I, I'm still here with you as you're running for your life. Everywhere you go, I will go with you. Jacob feels guilty about his past, fearful of the future, and uncertain in the present. To all of that, God simply says, I will be with you. I love that. Like I said earlier, God is the, is the total solution to guilt and fear and anxiety. These three things, it's kind of interesting. Guilt is about the past, right? What you've done, and you're guilty. And so there's, there's, there's this thing that builds up in you, guilt in the past. Fear is about the present, what, what you're facing right now. You're afraid what might happen, you know, what, what's happening now. Anxiety is about what's yet to come. What, what, what's around the corner? I don't know. You know, and it builds anxiety in us. God says, I'm there. I've got this. All three of those things. I was there yesterday. I'm here today. And I will be there in the future. God is always faithful. God was faithful to Jacob the cheater. That's number one. Number two, God is faithful to Israel the terrified. And by Israel, we mean the nation of Israel. The scene shifts to the Jews as, as they gather on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Moses is now old and he's about to die. Knowing the enemies his people will face when they enter Canaan, Moses tells them this, this amazing promise. This is Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. This is what it says. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. When Moses says, do not be afraid or terrified of them, he's talking about this whole big bunch of, uh, uh, of evil nations that were surrounding Israel that, that the Jews were going to have to face as they moved into the promised land. The list includes the Hivites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Philistines, and on and on. Another whole assortment. There's more than that. A few more anyway. Uh, assortment of bad guys. All of them were evil nations. And the Jews really faced a, a math problem. They are infinitely smaller than their enemies. They're really smaller than any one of those enemies. What are they going to do? And you remember, they had come to this point before and turned tail and ran, right? And now here they are again. What will they do? Now, it's interesting. Winston Churchill wrote a book uh, called The Splendid and the Vile. And, and in this book, it, it actually it chronicles the first year of his uh, uh, being a prime minister. In, in England, and, and it's when the Nazis seemed unstoppable and, and the eventual destruction of England seemed inevitable. Hitler, uh, up until that point, had just ran roughshod over Europe, and, and he is, uh, you know, it, it, it looks bad. It looks horrible for England. England's next. In his first, first speech as prime minister, Churchill spoke with brutal honesty. He said this, he said, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. In other words, it's going to be rough. I don't know how we're going to make it. I, you know, and, and the following years prove what he said to be true. And I sort of imagine the Israelites feeling the same way. Again, they faced this math problem. That, you know, if you stacked up all the armies against them, it's a lot higher, infinitely higher than what they have as, as, a, as a nation in, as far as an army. There are too many bad guys. <laughs> There's no way they can win the fight. They were doomed to defeat, but the question always was and is, who is on their side? Who is on our side? Yes, there may be blood and toil and tears and sweat, but when you fight with God on his side, when he is on your side, you cannot 
lose. That's the message to the people of God, to the nation of Israel. You may be afraid, but it's okay. God's on your side. He'll fight for you. Now, we need to lump in number three with this. Uh, we run the clock forward a few weeks and, and, and where we find Joshua, uh, the fearful. Moses has just died and, and Joshua now leads the people of Israel. They, they still must cross the Jordan River and begin this long series of, of battles against all these bad guys. You know, these, it take them seven years to complete all of this. But now the question becomes very personal. Is Joshua up to the challenge? And in Joshua 1.5, we find God's, God's answer, God's promise to him. This is what it says. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. This is for Joshua himself. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. This incredible promise to Joshua. It's an important promise, but we can't overlook the fact that what God says here is an important phrase in there. He says, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. Joshua knew all about Moses. He had been his right-hand man for, for lots of years. And, and Moses that stood before Pharaoh, you know, said, let my people go. And, and we know, you know, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And, and uh, when Pharaoh says no, Moses said it again. And then the, the plagues came down. There's boils and frogs and darkness and, and, and uh, hail and water turned to blood. And, and Pharaoh still would not relent. And, and finally, one terrible night, the, the death angel passed over the land, taking the life of every firstborn child. Uh, only those with the blood of a lamb on the doorpost were spared. Only then did, grudging, did Pharaoh grudgingly relent. When the people of God were trapped at the Red Sea, Moses stretched out his staff and, and the waters parted. So they walked across on dry ground. It swallowed up the army of Pharaoh behind them. Later, Moses went up the mountain to talk to the Lord face to face. He comes down with the Ten Commandments written in, in stone by the finger of God. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Oh, we could go well. All of these things happen in Moses' life. For 40 years, their shoes never wore out. For 40 years, they never ran out of food. For 40 years, they never lost a battle. Moses was the man. He's the leader. He's their hero. And I don't blame Joshua one bit for feeling inadequate. I, I, I shared last week with, with the people in Bloomington about my favorite spot in this church. And I've said this before, and some of you may remember, it's that little spot up behind the pulpit in the sanctuary. You remember that? Remember me telling you about that? I don't know if anyone knew it was even there. Uh, but, but there's this little spot behind the pulpit where, where the carpet is, 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 is worn down a little bit. And, and when I first saw it, it made me realize that, that I am, am just a, a part of a long history of faithful pastors that, that allowed God to lead them and, and, and spoke the truth of the gospel in that spot. And it's always, it's really overwhelming to me to recognize I am standing on the shoulders of great leaders. And, and I shared with them, now I'm, I'm in a new pulpit and, and behind a new pulpit and there's a whole nother uh, series. Names are different. Well, actually not all the names are different. Uh, some of you may, may rem remember uh, Roberson's move from here to Bloomington as well. So, so anyway, it's not quite the same, uh, all the same, all different names, but, but that one, uh, all but that one. Anyway, but now I stand in their shoes, in their spot, and it's always given me pause to think like that. You know, who am I to stand in that spot, either here or, or in, in Bloomington? For 125th, I got to know some of the names of those that came before me in this church, going back all the way to the beginning. How do you replace, how do you replace a legend? How do you take on this incredible calling when God leads you to something? Again, think about Joshua. How in the, how in the world do you feel the, fill the shoes of, of Moses? Well, God says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. What an amazing promise. We talked a few weeks ago about Moses' calling. If you remember how incredibly insecure he was about his ability to lead the people of Israel. Let's go back to Exodus 3.11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. 
And this will be the sign for, to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And God was with Moses and he did incredible things through Moses. Now it's Joshua's turn to take things over. And, and God says, I, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. As God was with Pastor Les Robenstein in Bloomington, so he also will be with me. As God was with my, me here in Mount Carmel, he will also be with the next pastor that comes in to fill this pulpit. And he'll be with the pastor after that. And he'll be with the pastor after that. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. Are you familiar with a little thing where one person says, I think you are, we've done it a few times, where, where like I would begin with God is good and you would say all the time, okay? And then I'd say all the time. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but that actually began in churches in Nigeria. They would do it often, but then they would add something. And, and after they, they said the first two parts, everyone in unison would say, I am a witness. I like that. So, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I am a witness. I love that. That's powerful. It's biblical. There's that's That really is the deeper meaning of the promise God made to Joshua. It's not a promise of an easy road or un, unlimited victory and, and no blood, sweat, and tears. After all, Joshua is a book of battles. But God is saying, you, you've got to fight for the land I'm giving you, but I will go with you. I will be with you. I will be leading you and helping you as you go. And you are my witness. You know, you saw what I did with Moses. You know what I'm promising to do in you, and you will be my witness to what it is. Let's move on to the fourth example that Spurgeon used. It's Solomon the timid. As King David grew older, he wanted to build a temple for the Lord in, in, in Jerusalem there. And, 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 but the Lord told him, no, you can't do it. Uh, he said, you're not, you're not the one. You're a man of, of blood. You're a, a warrior. God's house must be built by a man of peace. And so David accepted God's decree and called on his son Solomon to build the temple, to build the Lord's temple. Now, this is interesting. Here is David's encouragement to his son in 1 Chronicles 28, 20. It says, David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous. A lot like he said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Or like God said to Joshua. Anyway, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Now, that's a pretty heavy load to lay on a, on a young man. Solomon is the widest, wisest man on earth, but he follows the man who is considered to be after God's own heart, right? I don't know which is heavier, which is a bigger burden. And then you add on top of that, he's his own, it's his own son. It, it's, it's his father that he's following. I love my dad, <laughs> but I would not have wanted to follow him as a pastor. He was always so loved and such a gifted preacher and leader, a conference superintendent and, and so effective in ministry. It would have been really hard to, to, to try to immediately step into his shoes. It would be difficult. In this case, David was such a natural leader, a gifted poet, a mighty warrior. He unified the, the tribes, inspired the nation. Without a doubt, he was the greatest king to ever be in Israel. He still considered that. How would you like to follow a man like that? Sort of like Joshua following Moses, right? We get a glimpse of the pressure Solomon faced when David asked the leaders of the nation to support his son. This is what it says in 1 Chronicles 29.1. It says, then King David said to the whole assembly, my son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now, it's interesting. The, the word here again, there's a little bit of a problem in translation. The Hebrew word that's translated here, inexperienced, can also mean tender or delicate or, or timid. 
<laughs> now, again, this is in front of all these people, the leaders of Israel, and, and in front of his son, his son standing there as well. And, and, and David says, well, he, yeah, we know he's kind of inexperienced, and we know he's kind of timid and, and, and all. It, clearly, David wonders if his son is up for the task. No pressure, son, but this task is a big one. You're not building this for us. You're building it for, for the Lord God. I'd be timid too. I'd be shaking in my boots. I'd be fearful and worried. In some ways, though, I think that's a good place to be. Because when we feel like we aren't enough, when we feel like we can't do it, that's when God says, I'll not leave you. It's going to be okay. I'll not forsake you. I am going to be with you. God will finish the work he's called us to do. It's all on him, not on us. Everything God has for us, his power, his grace, his mercy, his love, his joy, are all contained in these simple words. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. It's going to be all right. Whatever you need from the Lord, he will supply it because he is faithful. He will never leave you. If you feel inadequate, that's good because it will make you depend even more on the Lord. There are things about moving to Bloomington that, that really scare me to death. <laughs> it, it's, it's, there's a lot of things about it. I don't, you know, there's a lot of different, it's going to be kind of different. But I know, I know God has called us there. And he will be faithful. And he will hold us fast. And, and he, he, will, he will hold all of you fast too. He will be with you. He is, will be with us. He is faithful. He will never leave our side. I can do this with his strength. You, you can do whatever as well in his strength. With him by your side, we'll be okay. God's got this. Now, how do you know this is to be true? There are lots of ways to answer that question. We might simply remind ourselves God's been faithful in the past. Maybe, maybe he has brought us through some deep water or whatever, uh, dark nights, bitter tears, whatever. Uh, life can get pretty rough, right? I know, know a lot of you know about that. But if he didn't leave you then, he's not going to leave you now. Think of all the prayers God has answered in your past. Wouldn't that be sort of wasted if God didn't? Keep going with his faithfulness. He's brought us this far to leave us now. How could he leave us now? You can hold on to this truth. God will never let you go. You're never alone. You're never abandoned. You're never on your own. What should we take away from all this? If like Jacob, you're guilty, take heart. God will never leave you. If you're like Israel, you're terrified, take heart. God will never leave you. If like Joshua, you feel unqualified, take heart. God will never leave you. If like Sol Solomon, you're kind of timid, you're kind of scared, there's, you know, you've never been through this before, God will never leave you. Think about it this way. God's not only with you now. He's, he's up the road a little ways too. <laughs> he, he's there and he's been there in the past. He's there today, but he's also there in the future as well. He is the God who goes before his people. That, that's a mind-blowing truth. Are you worried about next week? Well, forget it. He's already there. Are you worried about that next tornado that may come through town? Now, didn't think it was possible because we never had one, at least in my lifetime, never had one to go right through town like that. He's already there. What about the doctor's appointment? Sleep well. He's already there. What about that tough decision you have to make? Sleep well. He, he's already there. You know, fear not. It would be enough if God walked with us daily through this life, right? If he was just with us every moment of every, every day as we walk through this life. But the reality is, Scripture tells us he actually goes ahead of us. He is in tomorrow. He clears the way. He arranges the details so that when we get there, it's ready for us. Tomorrow is ready for us. Because God's already been there. He's at work in the future while we live in the present. That's how we can trust him. That's how we can rely on him today. We know he's already there in the future. It's going to be okay. Our God was with us yesterday. He is with us today. He will be with us tomorrow. That's what it means to say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I think probably many of us need this truth right now. I know I do. There's a lot of things I don't know about tomorrow. 
I passed over one part of Jacob's story so I could talk about it right now. When Jacob woke up from his dream, this is Genesis 28, 16. This is what it says. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. Sometimes we're like that, aren't we? We forget the Lord is with us, that he is there. Maybe we think that he's forgotten us. Maybe, but, but reality is, we are the ones who have forgotten him. Where is God when we need him? Well, he's with us. He's there. He's always been, even if we didn't know it. He is right with us. You can run away from God to the other side of the world. Get off, get off your airplane. Go to baggage claim. Guess what? God is there. He will meet you at baggage claim. It's interesting. Relatively few people meet God on a Sunday morning. You know that? You are more likely to meet God when, when you're sick when you lose your job, when, when you know, someone you love is sick, when a tornado comes through town, you know, uh, when your friends betray you, when a marriage collapses, on and on we could go. Often we don't pay attention to the Lord until tragedy strikes, until something where we have to have him, until there's a transition. And pastor, you know, where, okay, Lord, what are you going to do? You're going to have to take care of this. Often we don't pay attention to the Lord until tragedy strikes. And that's a real, real shame, isn't it? It's when we look up to heaven and say, surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't aware of it. Lord was here all along. I didn't see it. I didn't know it, but he was there. He was helping me. He was guiding me. This brings us back to this great promise. You are never alone. Let me tell you a great way to remember this. I, I came across it this week, and, and, and just, just, just do this with me. Hold, hold up your hand, and then begin with your thumb. I will never leave you okay let's do it again i will never leave you so simple and yet i remind you i will never leave you i will never leave you it's so simple to remember it's as close as your hand the lord is as close as your hand he is right there and he says i will never leave you it's as simple as that that is so powerful Easy to do, easy to remember. Build your life on this truth. God has said, wherever you go, I'll go with you. God was with us yesterday. God is with us today. God will be with us tomorrow. You're never alone. I will never leave you. I think I put in your bulletin, we were going to sing uh, something else. We're going to close today by singing again, He will hold me fast. I hope that's okay. We were going to sing, Be Strong in the Lord. But as I thought about it, I just love this song, He will hold me fast, because it is so true. He will hold us fast, all of us. He is faithful. Jennifer, would you sing, lead us and sing?
today for these wonderful realities that you will never leave us. You'll never leave us high and dry. People of this world do that all the time, but not you. You are faithful. You hold us fast. Lord, we thank you for this awesome promise, and we just ask that you will continue to be with us. You'll be with us. Help us be aware of your presence in everything we do and everywhere that we go, in the tough times, in the good times, when a tornado hits, when, when whatever happens, Lord, you, you will hold us fast. We thank you for this promise, Lord. You are faithful, always faithful. Thank you, Lord. Just ask your blessings on each one today. Be with us as we go. May we go in the knowledge of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget about our celebration tonight. We've got a lot of food, so come and join us.